Good morning, afternoon, or evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John Heed Maneed, and I am a consultant um, and software developer uh, from Shepherd's Oasis. And the thing I'm here to talk to you about today is the fundamental underpinnings of a text encoding API that's being proposed for standardization in C++, but that I'm also kind of developing independently. Um, alongside Shepherd's Oasis, uh, and how that enab how that new API is going to enable us to really make some significant and powerful changes uh, to the way that we handle text in C++ in general. And so the previous work that we had was uh, both part one and part two. Part one was given at CppCon in 2019. Part two was done at Meeting C++ in 2019. Um, the part one gives a very broad overview of the entire design space and where we pulled inspiration from and who we were working with. And part two is more of a greater look into some very specific points of the APIs and how to make it scale, how to make it work with, uh, you know, type erased encodings, right, so that we could support the use cases like that. Um, and also how to uh, use things like error handling to allow yourself to do uh, more powerful things uh, in the API. But now we're going to talk about some of the basis operations because it's been asked a couple of times uh, what the basis operations are and how we should be handling them. So let's take a look into those. First, we're going to talk about some constraints. Uh, if you watch the previous talks, then some of these constraints are going to be uh, repetitive, but basically, car is bad. Um, and car is bad for a lot of different things. Um, the first problem with car is that it has a fundamental issue with uh, what is its encoding is. Um, you don't necessarily know, right? Uh, the minute you interact with the system, the minute you interact with the C API, um, you don't really know whether or not you're actually getting a proper UTF-8 or you know some you know Windows one two five two or some other thing. And so the real fundamental uh, uh, improvement that we want to make here is uh, trying to fix this problem of what is the encoding of stuff is, right? Because right now people don't know what the encoding is and they just kind of make assumptions and those assumptions break down a lot. Uh, we also know that WCRT is bad and it's a real dead end, right? So it's UTF-16 on Windows, um, except when you use it with the standard library, in which case it will cut your surrogate pairs in half um, or ignore them entirely. Um, and so you'll end up with what's more closer to something like the 1990s UT, UCS2, which is, you know, where the only 16-bit was the maximum number of characters. So if you have more than 16 bits, they just kind of say, well, we don't need that. Um, and so it'll get mangled in it for today when you want to really actually be using UTF-16. Um, we have UTF-32 on policy machines, which is nice, um, except if it's an IBM uh, machine you're working on. Uh, and then you get UTF-16 on a 32-bit machine, UTF-32 on 64-bit machines, and then you get none of the above if you're on uh, a Chinese or Japanese-based uh, locale on any of those machines. Um, so that's incredibly unfortunate and it's just kind of the way the cookie, the cookie crumbles here. The other thing that's bad is CAR-16T and CAR-32T, um, particularly because there is a define in the C standard that says if uh, it's defined, if stood C, UTF-16, or UTF-32 are defined, then it's UTF-16 or UTF-32. And otherwise, well, it's just one big shoulder shrug. What exactly is the encoding of CAR-16, CAR-32T? Uh, at that point, who knows? And there's no really way to query it or figure it out or get an answer. Um, you just kind of have to consult your documentation and pray that your uh, developer, the developer of your compiler and your environment is a uh, jerk. Um, except not anymore. Um, Thanks to some influential work done by uh, RMF, uh, we have now um, mandated that CAR-16T and CAR-32T will be UTF-16 and UTF-32. Uh, this goes for C++20 onward, but thankfully we didn't find any implementations, C++ implementations that uh, differed from this behavior. Um, and we kind of strongly implied it with the wording. So thankfully uh, we get the benefit that CAR-16T and CAR-32T uh, will be UTF-16 and UTF-32 from CS plus 20 onward. Um, and, you know, even if it's not, even if you're not working with CS plus 20, you still kind of get the semi-de facto guarantee. We haven't found, again, we haven't found a compiler author who's done the wrong thing and, like, you know, tried to fit some weird encoding in CAR-16T or CAR-32T. Um, 
but uh, you know, there's always room for a special help plus plus implementation, right? So let's talk a little bit about uh, the general like API support, right? For C and CSS, what what does the the standard give you to to kind of go from one thing to another encoding in a, in a in a way that works and doesn't break and isn't fragile? Uh, this slide is intentionally left blank. Why? Because uh, there is uh, there is no support. It's it's a it's a uh, garbage shoot. Um, everything about it uh, ends up in the dumpster. Every API designed is bad uh, for a wide variety of reasons. Um, whether it's the locale based codec VT stuff, um, or the uh, C APIs, which have real problems with outputting multiple different characters, and uh, had to have a defect report filed against some of the functions, but they're still not proper for other functions and it's a mess um, to lack of wide character support for getting in and out of the wide character encoding to uh, normal encoding. Um, it's basically a nightmare um, in every single aspect of C and C++ and that nightmare has infected the world because uh, every single low-level device or embedded device that's built on top of these small C APIs and small like C standard libraries that are shipped by vendors uh, very much uh, has left people in the dark. So you have cache registers and other devices that really just can't stand up to the their needs of their users. Um, it's a real shame. It also produces a lot of frustration. Um, you know, so I get emails semi-regularly about, uh, you know, specifically this commit, but also other things. Um, this, this commit, you know, it's got some some uh, really bad ableist language in there, but, you know, it... it appropriately capture the frustration of locales and having locale based encodings and the nightmare that it is of working with uh, C and in and by by proxy C++ um, and so you know there's there's a lot of things you want to do right like so so people are like well, well we'll just fix it right and the first the first thing people always say is like car should just be UTF-8 right just 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 make car UTF-8 right mandate that in the standard get rid of all these locale encodings right like you know, nobody cares about all these old systems. Just, just make it UTF-8. Just use UTF. Just, just do it. Like, you know, just, just do it. Right? You know, they, they do, they do this. Do it. Just do it. You know, so people at committee meetings, um, and everybody didn't fully read UTF-8 everywhere, right? They always come to me and like, where's the U? Why isn't car UTF-8? Come on, like, you know, I can, you know, yes, cars, you know. The sign of car is completely implementation defined, right? So it could be signed or unsigned. But you know, I pass my compiler flag to to the thing, right? And I get unsigned. You know, my cars are of unsigned type, right? So I can, you know, just use UTF-8 and all the math is correct, and there's no bad overflow underflow, and it just does exactly what I want. So why don't we just do that? Um, and here's my hot take. Uh, we won't just do it. Uh, we actually just don't do that. And we can't do that for a lot of different reasons, right? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of problems with that, right? A lot of that is comes from like, oh, why does my string, gender string contain garbage, right? And that's because a lot of people try to run on this assumption that, oh, yeah, UTF-8 is, 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 is it's car. Car is totally UTF-8, right? They run with this assumption, and they bring it all over their code base, and then that happens when they use a C API or direct the environment, and they just lose, right? Um, because that's just, it's that's not what it is. Um, using car for both the system encoding and UTF-8 is wrong. It's in flagrantly wrong, right? Um, and it's flagrantly wrong because it will always make the wrong choice. Um, at some point, somebody's going to port some software, do some thing, and they're not going to be thinking about UTF-8 or whatever else. They're just going to be using strings, and your code is going, and that code is going to be wrong uh, on that environment, right? So you have to really go with the assumption that car will never be UTF-8 always, right? And you know, there's, you know, we hear about it in the committee, and and other proponents are like, excuse me. I can enforce it in my code, in my my pristine, beautiful code base that I can, you know, that I control completely, right? Um, and there's no way that it could possibly be anything but UTF-8, right? And that's what they say. And then uh, this happens, and they lose the game. And they always lose the game because they don't control the environment um, as much as they would love to. Uh, and so the, whether it's the car star argv or whether it's the uh, data that comes over the wire, or whether it's the C API that just doesn't really care and just generates the data from whatever your locale-based encoding there is, um, you lose. You end up losing. Um, and there's really no way around this kind of fundamental fact that the environment already has been thoroughly poisoned by locale-based encodings, and there's really not much that we can do about it. 
Um, and you also have to remember that like you're not you're not Google. You're not Bloomberg, you're not Facebook, you're not Microsoft, you're not, you're not some big tech company, right? I mean, some of you listening might be, but you don't own the entire tech stack, right? You don't own the user's locale. You can't tell them what to do with it. And you are the piece in a much bigger pie, right? So you can't just say, well, everything's going to be UTF-8 and that's just the way it's going to be uh, because you don't, right? Like when, when, when Google and Microsoft, if you're working global foundation services or whatever else, right? Like they get a machine, right? They control it. The minute that machine gets hooked up to their racks and their data centers all the way out to the time that they, they send you something, right? Like they control every single part of the stack, right? They have the operating system, everything else. Google, similar deal. Bloomberg, similar deal. Facebook, not exactly the same deal, but again, for, for server base, right? They can control everything, right? They can, you know, part of their spin up is that UTF-8 is applied as locale and et cetera, et cetera. And they verify this and it's checked, but you can't do that as the end user, right? And remember that the C++ standard is for everybody, right? Not just for the big tech companies. So you need to remember that you are part of a, a much bigger, that you are a piece of a much bigger pie. And please, please, please don't forget that, you know, for as much as you'd like to rage against the machine and say everything should be UTF-8, uh, please don't forget that you are a much bigger piece of pie that you fit in with the legacy and that not everybody can afford to uh, have your crazy, super awesome Kubernetes setup uh, and make everything wonderful. So um, now that we've got kind of past some of the constraints and the issues that we have, uh, let's talk about encoding objects, right? And, and, and how this would be useful. Um, so I've talked about this before, but I'm going to give a quick run through again of what an encoding object is. And basically it's at minimum a collection of three type definitions, code point, code unit, and state, two static member variables, which is just a number, an integer that you know, tells you the maximum number of code points and the maximum number of code units that can be output by a single operation. Then you have the two operations, the, 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 the single functions, right? So you have encode one, which can uh, take some code points and output some code units in the specified encoding or take some code units of that encoding and output, output some code points, you know, typically, you know, your unit code UTF-32 code points in that encoding. And that's basically how that works. And that's it. Uh, this, this, is, this is the uh, hill that I'm going to die on. This is the uh, wrong that I'm going to hang my hat on. Uh, this is where I'm going to put my code in. Um, this is all you need, period, point blank. You only need those seven things. That's it. That's lucky seven. You're sit that you can build literally everything on top of that. And now some of you are probably looking at me like, uh, pardon me? Is that true? Um, I'm going to show, I'm, I'm going to prove it to you, right? I'm going to prove to you that that's all you need to do everything, right? So here's some supporting structures, right? So we have some struct, an, an empty structure, right? It's literally, it's literally just an empty struct. It's got nothing in it. It's just, it's just two, two, uh, two braces. Um, we've got a byte span, which is just a span of stood byte, and a bunch of type defs, you know, for spans of various types. So you have C span, which is a car span, U8 span, which is a car AT span, U16 span, you know, car 16, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have an encoding error type, which, you know, can be encoding error okay, which is just, you know, everything's fine, which is zero because that's what APIs do. Um, invalid sequence, which means uh, you tried to encode something, uh, but it was just the bytes were wrong. Um, incomplete input, which means we read everything you gave us and it was all correct, but you didn't finish giving us, right? So if you gave me uh, two UTF-8 code units, two bytes, and I needed three to uh, complete, you know, the, the smiley face you wanted me to emoji the emoji to make for you. Well, then, you know, invalid, you know, incomplete input is 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 exactly what you would. Wear. And insufficient output space is the last one where it's just, oh, there isn't enough space in the buffer you handed me, right? So we're not gonna like, we by default we don't like overflow your buffers. Um, we tell you no, no, there's not enough space to to do what you want to. And and if any of these trigger, then we don't output any information at all into the um. Uh, into the final output buffer, right? If any of these trigger. So for an example encoding, um, here's some of the result types you get back. So when you call these low level functions like encode one, decode one, these are the kinds of things you get out, right? And they, they contain five pieces of information. Um, it contains the input, which is the input that you put in, uh, you know, post, uh, post decode or encode. Um, and we also give you the output, which is the uh, after the encoder decode, like the rest of the buffer. So we, we use up some of the buffer, you know, the output, obviously your, your, your code points or code units, and then we leave you with the rest of the buffer. Um, we return you a reference to the state that you handed us. Um, and if, you know, that's the case, then that's fine. Um, we return an encoding error. So if something does go wrong, if this is not equal to encoding error, colon, colon, okay, then we, you know, you get to know about that. And we also have a Boolean if you handled an error. And this is kind of important because there's some uh, 
uh, error handlers that will insert uh, like replacement characters and other things, and then like erase the encoding error to say everything's fine, it's okay. But you still want to know if there's like an error happening. You did actually handle an error anyway, right? If you did make replacements, but we still kind of scrub the the encoding error error code, um, you still want to know if that's happening. So that's what handled error is for. And it's literally the same thing. It's for both decoded and encoded. It's literally the same thing. It's just you know what, what depends on what the input is and what the output is, and that's where you, you're doing encode or decode. So more results types. Um, this is literally it's literally the same thing, um, except in this case it's for U8, and we're going to talk about what this, this U8 means um, in a second. But it's literally the same thing. You have an input of a car 8 T span, output of car 3 T span, and then everything's identical. Um, we have some error handlers, and I talk a lot about this in the part two presentation um, about what you can do with this and like the different ways that you can like you can do replacement characters, or you can find the first valid sequence and do a replacement character. And I won't go into too much into detail here, but basically, you have a function that has a signature of taking the result by value and returning the result by value, taking the encoding that you gave it by val uh, by const reference, and then also handing you a span of any characters that were read but weren't used uh, to produce uh, the final. Uh, value. Um, and this is kind of helpful uh, for, for uh, things like forward, for like uh, things like um, uh, input iterators. For for example, if you're reading from like std c in with a std i stream iterator, um, once we read a value and go forward, we can't really go backwards. So uh, it's important that we give you any code points or code units that we read from the stream uh, instead of just like letting, losing them to time whenever an error happens. And so that's what those, that's what the, these three parameters are. Um, again, we're not going to go too much into it. There's other talks that will that, again go into this in depth, but it's just for the purpose of setup and, and, and make sure that you can follow along. So here's an example of exotic encoding. Um, so there's actually an encoding called UTF Absidec, and you've probably never heard of it, um, and that's great. Uh, so if you never heard of it and you haven't used it, uh, bless your soul. <laughs> um, so the, we have the seven you know lucky things here, right? So we have our three type depths, so we have a code unit of car, right? It's just it's just a car input, right? And that's just when you're when you're working on you know IBM machines and you're working with Epsidex, it's just car. Um, you have an output code point, which is a car thirty two T, so we're outputting Unicode code points. Um, our state is just an empty struct because there's no like shift statements or special sequences we need to calculate or do anything with. Um, we have a max code points of one, which is uh, the maximum number of code points a single decode one operation can output, right? So when we call decode one, we can only output one code point at most. And finally, we have max code units, which in this case is six, because that's the maximum number of code units that can be output from a single operation. Um, and that's exactly everything that you're gonna need as far as the, the types and, and variables are concerned. And then for the functions, you have an encode one function and a decode one function. And the whole point about this is that for encode one, we, you take an input of, of, of things and it outputs uh, the, 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 it outputs the actual uh, uh, characters that are in the encoding, um, or you decode one and you take in code points and you, you take in uh, characters and you output the, the code point, uh, sequence of code points, right? And so in this case, you only get out one code point when you're doing decoding, but you can get up, you can get from zero up to six code units from a uh, uh, encode one call. And that's basically how that, that works. Here's a more common encoding. Um, so if we were to have a UTF-8, I mean, it's literally identical in almost every single way, except in this case, the math code units is four, um, because a single code point can only be expanded to four code units, and that's like the maximum expansion. And the reason we have these max code points and code units types on, on both the UTF EPSIDEC and the UTF-8 is because uh, this allows us to have, uh, to know the maximum size of an output given any input uh, that we do for any operation, right? And this is again important for what we'll see down the line uh, later in this presentation uh, for, for memory usage and everything else. And I'm absolutely deadly serious when I mean that everything, literally everything, can be built out of these sevens, right? I can bulk encode, decode, and, and even transcode between A and B uh, using, just this, using just this interface. I can validate text using just this interface. And I can do counting, right? How many code points or code units will come out on the other side? Um, and I can also build some ranges on top of this, right? So if I, you know, I want to have a lazy range that doesn't necessarily bulk encode and take up memory, but I need to walk the code points one by one, I can create flexible ranges that don't that take a fixed amount of memory 
uh, and you know output code points that I can say use for free type or you know harf buzz or uh, maybe pango or some other library and and this all all works sort of almost um, so there's, there's one other operation that can be added it's not required but it can be added um, decode one backwards and encode one backwards um, so iterator is obtained from encoding view and decoding view uh, uh, types like which are views that allow you to walk over a sequence of text and, and work with it um, in order to be able to go backwards, you need to be have one of these functions because I can't like synthesize a backwards operation from those seven. Um, but this is a very rare case, and it's not required. Um, but it's just still good to know that you know if you want to go backwards over some text, which is, this is rare. Uh, usually, usually the only people who ask to reverse text are like interviewers, honestly. Um, you, this is this is what supports that. These these two functions are in support of that, but it's not the it's not part of the required core base, right? And I also want to be very specific about why is encode one and decode one the thing that we're using rather than just, you know, a bulk encode or a bulk decode uh, uh, thing, right? That doesn't only output one unit of information. And the reason we do this is because it saves us higher levels of abstraction, right? So if we only output one unit of information, or only consume one unit of information, what it means is, is that I can predictably size my output buffer and know I have exactly enough to handle one unit of complete output. And this is important when I want to do things like make ranges or preserve memory, uh, preserve certain memory uh, uh, constraints, or if I want to make it so that I never have an insufficient output error, right? If I have a range-based API that always greedily consumes the most amount of information it can and outputs as much as it possibly can, then I end up in a really bad state where every single call I make to the API can always have insufficient output as an error, right? By making it so I only output one unit of information, not only do I make the API less complicated for an end user to implement, right? So if you were writing your own encoding and you wanted to implement encode one and decode one, it's easier, but it also means that a class of errors never happens, right? And it also means that I never have to do things like save state between encoding object calls and other things like that. It also gives the end user access to data to do as they want with it, right? And so by not overly consuming and not having to store any extra state, I can enable people who have networking buffers and everything else to reuse their buffers and other things like that without requiring them to also cart around uh, potentially stateless encoding types, which is very much important. So some of the standard encodings that we're going to get for CSS 23 are the encoding scheme type, which will allow you to basically take uh, other encodings and apply an endianness to them. So if you wanted UTF-16 little endian, you can do that. If you wanted a wide execution with a big endian spin, you can do that, um, whatever else, right? And it's just this kind of uh, generic scheme type. Um, then the you know your concrete encodings are your ASCII, your narrow execution, and your wide execution. The narrow execution and wide execution correspond to CAR and uh, WCAR-T as defined by the locale in the library, so that's why it's execution. Then we have narrow literal and wide literal, which correspond to the assumed encoding that your compiler dumps out when you know you give it a string literal and it says, put the string literal in my binary when you're serializing. That's what narrow literal is, right? And it can be different from what the actual execution encoding is, uh, the narrow execution, the wide execution encoding that ends up being run by your system. Um, so that's why those are two different things. And then we just have the typical UTF-8, 16.32. Yeah, typical uh, basic stuff. We, we talked about this in part one of the uh, uh, of, of these presentations as well, if you want more information. Now, some of you are like, okay, listen, like, there is a lot more encodings, right? I've, I've spent my time on the web. I've spent my time, you know, I'm, I'm from Japan. I, Shift.js is still very prevalent. Um, I'm in Russia. I have a bunch of other different encodings that I really need to handle here, right? Like... There needs to be a lot more encodings than this. If I, if you want me to use this with like my mail client or something like that, or to build out some of these these other abstractions. And so, you know, in late CS plus twenty three or perhaps early CS plus twenty six, um, we do plan to provide the entire what WG suite of encodings, right? I mean, I say we as in we as Shepherd's Oasis do plan to provide all of that, but you know, we'll see how it goes with the committee. Um, and also, you know, legacy encodings, code pages, library. For example, Microsoft, if you look in their, their open source STL, you can see that they have a wide variety of encodings baked in. And maybe as a vendor, it's personally interesting to them to ship additional encodings. And so they can. Um, 
and so also just a sorting type so you can kind of collect these encodings and do that but also i the, the the really big point here is that you can make your own there's no special tricks no secrets no 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 special magic implementer foo that you need to know here right everything just comes from these seven different basis operations and that is incredibly important we're going to talk about why that's important uh, 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 going forward, right? And and why you can build almost everything based on these seven operations. So let's let's extrapolate some base operations, right? Let's let's do the let's do the math here and everything else. Um, so if I wanted to do transcoding, validation, or counting, or a bunch of other stuff, right? The idea here is that with those seven operations, that's everything I need. So let's let's talk a little about transcoding, right? You know, going from one encoding to another. I have a simple idea. I have a from encoding. And I have a two encoding. They're both encoding objects. And I have these encode one decode functions. And so what I my, my what I postulate here is that if I have a common code point between them, if they can represent all the same values, you know, within reason, um, and it does not error during the encode step or the decode step, then I can always transcode. That's it. That's that's the you know, you know, if this was a math book, there'd be you know theorem and it'd be in that like cool box and you know, theorem with the italic text like blah blah, you know. Simple idea, you know, from encoding to encoding, you know, you know, you get the the the, the upside down sigma signs and all other cool and all other cool stuff you find in math books, right? But the idea here is that our theorem is that we can always transcode if if these hold, right? This is a uh, the diagram from the part one talk, the CPCon 2019 talk, and so as you can see here, right, we have this idea, right, that you can take an encoded single input, right? I can decode that to a Unicode code point. I can take that Unicode code point, I can then encode it, and then from there I have an encoded single output. And through this loop, through this four-step dance we do, we get access to every single encoding as long as they have a common code point type. In this case, the common code point type is almost 99.999% of the time UTF-32, right? That we get code points out. And that it works, and that's what that means. And so that's this is this is the picture form of the theorem here, right? It's probably not math book ready, but you know, gets the job done. And so let's let's do a little bit of setup here, right? So we have this transcode result type, and we're going from UTF epsidec UE um, to UTF eight U eight. And so in this case, we have a C span input, we have a U eight uh, of output, right? UTF eight output, and the the C span of input, right? We have a from state and a to state, which again they're just empty structs because there's no state for uh, UTF epsidic and UTF eight, um, and we track the encoding error and the handle error, right? And that's that's just how that works. Um, so let's take a look at uh, uh, if this this works now, if this holds, All right? So let's let's implement transcode. So in this case, I'm I'm being simple here, right? We have the handler type; it's just a default text handler. It works. Um, we get the encoding state of UTF of UTF epsidic. That's our from state. We have the encoding state of UTF eight. That's our to state. And then we have this wonderful, wonderful uh, in-between T, which is just the encoding cone point of UTF epsidic. Now, in between some of these lines, there's going to be some static asserts that basically confirm that the code point types are indeed compatible. Um, and this is implemented in the library, but for the slide where we're not going to, you know, the, the, this actually outputs a really big message, so I can't fit that on the slide, so you'll just have to look at this. Um, but in this case, we, we have our, our encoding code point, we have our in-between type, uh, and now we can make a buffer of it, a just a plain C array that takes the maximum code points of UTF epsidic, right? So U, UTF epsidic can output at maximum one code point, right? So we have a buffer that's big enough to handle all of the output from UTF epsidic, right? Then we create a span over that buffer, right? So you want to view the whole buffer, right? So we take a span of the intermediate buffer, right? And that's there we go. We got our array. It's it's all set. It's all cool, right? Perfect. Um, and then we begin a for loop. This for loop, you know, we just use the double semicolon to mean that we're going to run forever until we reach our stop conditions. And so here is the basic idea. If I have a from encoding, and I call decode one on the input into the intermediate, and I pass the handler and, and the necessary state variable, that result will get me decoded code points. I'll have code points in my hands in, in, in the intermediate buffer, right? I, I fix up the input after I do that by moving the, the from results input back into the, the input type so that I can update the input variable, 
Um, and then I check if the error code of the result is not equal to okay, right? And if it's not, then we bail, right? We give the we give our current input, right? How much we read, the output, uh, we give the error code um, that we got, and then all the other information like the state and everything else, right? Um, but if there is no error, then we compute the used, right? And what the used is, is you know, this is this looks kind of weird, right? We're calling intermediate on the, the intermediate span, we're getting its data, and then we're getting the from result output.data, which is of the same type as intermediate, right? It's another span. And we're calling dot data on it to get some more information. And the way this works is very simple, right? The first row is our current intermediate, right? It's the actual span. The second row is our actual is our second span that comes from the from result that dot output. And what this means is is that we are basically measuring from the beginning of the intermediate to where we stopped at the from result output, right? So it always in, it always writes into the the output range and then stops at the when it's done writing things. And so we basically are we're just measuring the distance between those two, and that gives us what's used. That gives us the used portion of the of the data, right? And that's that's what we're getting. That's what we're gunning for here. Now. From there, we need to do the second half of the operation, right? Which is encode into new code units, right? So we take our use span, right? That we that we computed doing that we computed doing all this, right? That that blue mark spart is the use span, and then we give the original output, right? The original output that we're going to write into, and then the handler, and then you know the the, the state. Um, we update the output if. We update the output, and then we check if the two results error code uh, is wrong. And if it's wrong, then we return, we move the output, and we return the error code, and everything's wrong, and whatever else. But if we succeed, well, we check if the input is empty, and if it is, we stop. Otherwise, we loop back, and we start doing it all over again, right? And until we break, uh, or until we return an error, um, we keep going until we can finally say, return the input and the output as they are, etc., etc., right? And so the input and output here represent the... Uh, represent data that hasn't been touched yet. So you input the data that uh, uh, that hasn't been touched yet, and we, we increment it forward all the way, and then we kind of hand you back and say, we haven't used, this is the part of the span or the output or whatever else that hasn't been touched yet. And that's that's how that works. And, well, that's it. Um, this whole loop here that I, that I just described to you is is the entirety of it, right? We just implemented transcode, right? Between two different encoders, we implemented transcode by calling these defined functions on the thing. And that's it. That is literally all you need to do transcoding, right? And if you just replace the specific hard coding of, of, of the UTF EBCDIC and the UTF-8 here, you can do this between any two encodings as long as the code point types are common. And that is what, I, as I've just proven to you, is possible with this API. So, so let's move on from that, right? And let's talk about something else, right? What about validation, right? Like, I want to verify that some text is in the proper encoding or that it can be uh, in the proper encoding, right? And so the idea here is somewhat simple. Um, it's the same loop and check idea, right? So we have, we get our code point, our code unit, we get the uh, uh, from state, the to state. We get a buffer of the code points and a buffer of the code units. We create an intermediate buffer and an output intermediate buffer. And what we do here is for this, we do the same loop, right? So we call from result, decode one, the input to the intermediate. We check that the error code happens, blah, blah, blah. Right, then we use the span to get the use calculation all over again. Then we call encode one with the use to the output, and then we get the handler and the Tuesday, blah, blah, you know, it's the same loop, right? Anytime we fail with an error, we return false, right? Because obviously it can't have worked if we get an error, right? Then that means that the text isn't valid, right? Because there's no way it could possibly be represented in this, this code, right? Then we move on to the next part of validation, right? Which we create a mirror input, right? It's just the same use calculation, but we're doing it for the output uh, we're doing it for the output of the to result rather than the output of the front result, right? So this is at the very end. We're getting, we're calculating the used of the output, right? And so we get a C-span of mirror input. And what this enables us to do is we check, is the mirror input that we got from the operation, right? We did the whole loop, right? We did, we did one cycle of the loop, right? We went from the input 
to the output and then back to the input again using the exact same encoding type, right? Like I, I want to emphasize here that the, the thing here is that we're not using a from encoding and a to encoding. We're using the encoding itself, right? It, both times. And so when you do decode one and encode one and you loop it through, right? The whole point is that if you go, if you round trip through the encoding, right? No error should happen. And the input should be exactly identical to the output that you get, right? So the, the input should be identical to the mirror input, right? So we do std equals, you, and we, you know, we get the iterators and we call the function. And if it's not equal, we return false. Otherwise, we update the input and we loop back around, right? And if this loops through the whole thing and we reach input.empty, then we return true, right? And well, that's it, right? We, we literally already defined transcoding as decode some code points. If it error, return with error, else take the decoded code points and put it into the encode step. If error, return with error, else loop back if the input is not empty, right? Except in this case, rather than returning with error, we're just returning false for the fact that it can't be, right? it's not valid text. It's not valid in that encoding, right? But it's, it's literally the exact same idea, right? And so the whole point here is that this whole thing holds up and works without any additional effort, right? Now, of course, you can also even do this with the lazier possible, right? Like you can use transcode to do the actual validate, right? Rather than implementing validate as a loop, you can implement it as a call to transcode, right? So we call transcode and we give it the input and the out and an output buffer, but instead of actually uh, uh, providing a to encoding and a, and a from encoding, we just use the same encoding twice, right? We use the encoding from the to and the encoding as a from encoding, right? And what that means is that we're basically doing, we're basically checking between itself, can it loop, can it do a full loop, right, of encoding and decoding amongst itself? And if it can do that, we check if the result error code is okay, and we also do a std equals if the input is complete, is exactly equal to the output in both size and actual values. And that's it. This is, this is a valid, perfectly good implementation of validate, right? And it's built entirely off of the transcode call. Now, for obvious reasons, I don't recommend this, right? We are literally creating a std vector the size of the input, right? Like that's going to be a little bit wasteful. That that's going to be just, just a tad, just a tad bit wasteful there. Um, so obviously we don't want to do it like this, but the whole point is that it works and it scales, right? So we use a loop version because obviously we don't want to have infinite memory consumption, but the whole point is that uh, it works, right? And that's extremely useful. So now let's also do counting, right? So how many code units or code points will this operation yield? And I'm not actually going to do this one for you, right? It's, we leave this one as an exercise for the viewer, but it's, it's, it's not hard. It's really not hard. It's not a trick. It's the same idea, right? It's just instead of counting it, right? We use the use calculation from the last, from the last portion of the loop. And we just, you know, count the code points or count the code units and bada bing, bada boom. We've got ourselves exactly what we're looking for. Um, and that's just exactly how that works. Now, I'm not actually going to leave it to you as an exercise. I'm not going to say, yeah, go take these things, go take these encoding objects and go implement transcode, validate, encode, count, decode, count, all this other stuff. No, you don't, no, 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 no we're not going to do that, right? We, the, the, the paper, and you can read it in the paper, the official C++ paper, the working draft that's on my blog. Um, we provide all this for you, right? And not only do we provide all for you, but we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we do the templating, right? We, we take the error handles, we'll do the checking. Is this a proper range? You know, do we need to boil this down to a range, et cetera, et cetera, right? But we'll have decode and decode into, right? Where decode into actually takes the output and you, we output in the output. But if you don't care about the output, then we just call it, you could just call decode and we'll like spin up a vector for you, whatever, if you're lazy. Um, we also do this for encode, where we have encode into, where you can pass the output, um, and we'll fill it up uh, as much as we can, or we'll just, you know, or, or you just call it encode, and we'll, we'll create an, uh, an output, and we'll do reserve call and a bunch of other stuff, and can do a string. That's exactly what you wanted. Um, we also have validate calls, um, and we also have, uh, you know, the encode one and decode one accounts, right? And we provide this all for you, right? We it's templated, we do all the shenanigans underneath, right? But the whole point is that you can plug in any encoding object. Or any two encoding objects when it comes to transcode, and it works, right? So to to give you an idea, um, this is just kind of a quick basic of using some of the basic overloads, right? So you can call in in the desired API. What you do is you can call std text validate as, and you can check if 
can I take this UTF-32 heart and like put it in my, 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 my literal encoding, right? And this will assert at compile time, right? Because all of this is const expert, right? That you can handle that heart, right? That can be put in your literal encoding, right? So if you have certain things that need UTF support, right? You can static assert a bunch of characters in the, you know, the bilingual multiplane or some emoji that are farther than that, and it works, right? You'll be able to check at compile time, like, no, 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 your, 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 your literal encoding needs to be able to handle this, right? And that's important. Um, you can also just call std text encode. Like I said, there's simple overloads. So you can just pass a string in, you call encode, you get out UTF-8 emoji. We generally assume that when you're doing encoding and you pass us a UTF-32 string, we'll just kind of assume you want to go to UTF-8, so that's the default. Um, but if you don't, right, you can pass in like std text ASCII with the replacement handler. And this actually just ends up as a, uh, a question mark um, because uh, ASCII can't handle uh, uh, anything more than that. And that's just the way that works. But most importantly uh, about all of this, about the simple API and everything else, the basis never changes. The seven operations are still the seven operations you use to build everything. Now, obviously there's arguments to make for performance and everything else, but the entire point is that you can at minimum write these seven things and you will have perfect interoperability and safety and everything else for the entire ecosystem at no cost to you. And I want you, I really want to emphasize, right? The basis never changes. The basis operations are what we compose the entirety of our text encoding APIs out of and enjoy full support without having to do any additional work or labor. No additional work on the standard library implementer's part and no additional work on your part. And that is why this API is infinitely scalable and better than almost every single API out there currently in the world. It's this, just these, these lucky, lucky seven is exactly what you want, right? And obviously, if you want more speed and safety, there's different hooks and other things you can do. And I described some of that in part one. I'll also be going back, going into that in part four, which might happen in either CPP Russia, which might be online and some other stuff. Um, but the whole point is that you have the seven magic number and that encapsulates everything you need. And it's all yours. Each encoding object is its own type and it strongly controls its semantics and representation, right? And there's no committee telling you what to do. No standard library saying it's not important enough to be added and that your use case isn't good enough. There's no gods, no masters, no one to stand in our way. And that means that we will seize the means of production. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, and that's what's the magical bit here. Um, and of course, the other magical part here about this whole thing is you for listening. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for tuning into this presentation. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you're excited about the future of text for C++. Um, I hope that we can get this API through to the standards committee and make a real difference. Um, I just want to spend a moment thanking all of my wonderful individual patrons and sponsors um, who have... Uh, wonderfully helped me up during this time, especially even now. Um, I know it's very hard to uh, part with your hard-earned dollars in a time like this, um, and I'm super glad that you're supporting uh, my work and everything else that I do, whether it's standards work, uh, Itsy Bitsy, the Bit Library, everything else. Please, please, uh, pat yourselves on the back. I hope that I am returning, by working on these things and doing these things for the Standards Committee and the C Committee, that I'm returning great value to you. I also wanted to thank the NEN, standards body in the Netherlands who took me on uh, on a recommendation from someone and have allowed me uh, by their sponsorship to continue to attend the WG14C standards meetings and push for new APIs that make this whole thing better. Um, so very much thank you to NEN. You can check them out on their website. Um, and of course, there's emails, phone numbers and everything else there. Um, if you're Dutch or even Dutch adjacent and you want to help with these things, uh, you can definitely ask and, and they'll be happy to help you out um, and maybe even help get you to, as long as you're pushing, you know, for standards and other things like that, they'd be able to help you out. Um, and that would be great. And I just wanted to thank all the various people who put together various media um, that I use in these slides. 
um, you know, just giving credit where credit is due. Uh, and of course, uh, if you'd like to be part of one of those people who helps, one of part of one of those patrons, um, you want to support us, uh, Vision for Fluid Text Handling in C and C++. Um, there's a plan at the portfolio text link. There is, you can support the plan with the, uh, 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 at the link there. Um, and of course, um, if you don't want to just support the plan directly with donations, you can always contract and consult us. Um, please send an email to shepherd at soasis.org. We do pretty much everything, system profiling, hardening, testing, performance. We're also sort of known as the text people, scripting on small devices, a whole bunch of things, C, C++, whatever language you uh, got in mind or whatever task you have at hand, uh, we will be there to uh, provide a wonderful place for you to rest your head easy knowing that it will be taken care of. Any questions?